Thank you, Honorable President Chan, for your very really warm remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted now to welcome the speaker for this evening, Dr. Park Sanne, who is Professor Emeritus at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Before we begin, I would like to introduce him briefly. As Dr. Chan, President Chan rightly pointed out, Professor Park Sanne is one of the pioneers in the field of history of science in Korea. He is like Joseph Dinner, Korean Joseph Dinner. He has studied physics for his undergraduate degree at Seoul National University. Subsequently, he went to the United States, where he completed his MA and PhD degrees. His PhD degree was from the University of Hawaii, where he wrote his dissertation entitled Portents and Politics in Korean History. Portents refers to the natural phenomena like eclipse or other natural phenomena and how these portents affected the course of politics. This was one of the most pioneer researches that he completed with way back in the 1960s. And subsequently, he joined Hanguk University of Foreign Studies as a professor of history, where he was as dean and also vice president. He held many important positions, which I won't, I won't mention, but you can buy his book, Portents and Politics in Korean History, from uh, any bookshop. It's published by Tirum Da. It's about 15,000 or 20,000 skip. So, it won't be heavy on your pocket. So, without much ado, now I will introduce, I would like to request Mr. Okay. Patsman Nain to deliver his name. So, please welcome. Uh, thank you very much for kind introduction of me. Uh, I'm overwhelmed uh, with uh, so many dignitaries tonight, so I'm not sure I can deliver my speech uh, normally. I hope I can do. Uh, I prepared my lecture in a rather long manuscript, which I cannot go into the details, all of them. So probably I, I can go uh, from PowerPoint presentation to the manuscript, go and open uh, on and off from here to. But for the more, with these small characters printed, I cannot read it. Uh, <laughs> without changing my glasses. It's cumbersome to, to do that all the time, right? So I'll just uh, try to explain. Uh, the manuscript is written in two parts, uh, in a way. The first uh, several pages are about uh, traditional Korean uh, scientific achievements. Uh, by the way, this part was already <laughs> briefly introduced to you by President Chung jung -gil. So I wouldn't go into the details perhaps. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and the latter half of or, or the uh, first uh, in the, let me see, yeah, page three, I start, uh, I try to explain briefly about the, about the gist, the, the, the important portion of the development of Western science in Europe, uh, and uh, of course it's a very brief introduction, because uh, I want to explain how the three East Asian countries, including Korea, Japan, and China, had uh, developed in the science technology uh, in, in their modernization efforts, comparatively. This part is very important for my, uh, to my mind, so this part will be the highlight of uh, my presentation tonight, I think. 
So after that, I'll try to introduce briefly what happened after the liberation of Korea from the Japanese colon colony in 1945, because at the point of the liberation of Korea in 1945, Korea was, was not, nothing in terms of science and technology. It's a barren country. So I try to, but today uh, we are somewhat developed in many ways, uh, as much as in science and technology also. So I try to explain the process uh, briefly in the final portion of my manuscript. So if you are kind enough, you can bring this manuscript, go home and read it, <laughs> if you can, if you want. But I try to explain, uh, showing these uh, slides, that would be more interesting maybe for you because it's a visualized presentation of my uh, lecture tonight. I usually, if, if I go up to the podium, I take too long time. So I, I probably, I, I cannot stop my lecture tonight. <laughs> so when the time is up, please tell me when I have to stop. Okay, next. This is uh, what the, all the Koreans are proud of, uh, the, the scientific relic, the traditional, the most famous scientific achievement or relic in Korean history. This is called the Chomsong Day in Korean. It's uh, translated, the standard translation in English is a stargazing tower, or it's, it's called usually stargazing tower. It's uh, myth mythical. Strange, we are not sure whether this was actually the solar, the, the uh, star observation device or not. We are not too sure. But the term itself, Chomsongde, means stargazing tower. So we presume it's uh, built there in Gyeongju. Many of you have seen, must have seen this. Uh, this uh, uh, building in Gyeongju, the old capital of Silla dynasty. Anyway, this is uh, very much uh, mystical, strange, but it can be interpreted as a kind of uh, a mathematical presentation of the knowledge of heavens in the traditional period. This, this, this was built in 641 or 644, uh, how you read the, read the uh, history documents. Any, anyhow, it's mid-7th century, it was built there, and still there uh, as it had been all the time. This shows many, many symbolic presentation. So I try to show what symbolism we can read from this uh, uh, tower in the first page. So I don't, I don't think I can, I can go through this whole, whole thing, but, but very interesting thing is the layer, round layer, is 20, uh, 28. And, and this uh, window towards the south Divides the upper part and lower part. And the, the layer, round layer, 12 layers are, are under the window, and the same number of layers are above the window. So 12, 12, and altogether 28. If, if you add these uh, square things, then it can be 29 and 30. And the stones, stone pieces used for this uh, tower is about 306 sum. Then you can tell what symbolism we can read from this tower, right? One year. The days of months, days of, uh, the, month, the, the number of months in a year, uh, days of months, or not. 
uh, all kinds of symbol, symbols we can need. So uh, we can interpret that this was built uh, with, the, with the complete knowledge of the calendrical sciences in the 8th century Silla people. Then much we can say, and we, we can go to the next. Uh, after that, we can, I can mention briefly about the, the Korea people's achievement in, in printing tec techniques. So that follows the thereafter, after the Chomsung there. And we, I can uh, quote uh, some gunpowder development in the page two. And we come to the middle part of the page two. I come to the, uh, the reign period of King Sejong. King Sejong is uh, very famous in Korean history. And all Koreans are proud of King Sejong's period because his, and his statue you can see in the, uh, in the Gwanghamun Square area, right? So King Sejong, he achieved uh, President Chong Jong-gil introduced about it, his, uh, his invention of, uh, of Hangul. Of course, Hangul is a very scientific achievement. I, I try, to, try to quote from BBC, British Broadcasting, BBC, on page three above. You can read the, the quote I, I used to explain the excellent place, scientific achievements as Hangul uh, there. But other than that, very important uh, thing King Sejong's period achieved was, uh, the, was the achievement of uh, the, the compilation of uh, so-called uh, calculations of the seven luminaries. I, I wrote this in, manuscript, in my, my manuscript, page two, exactly in the middle. Seven Chilcheongsan. The, that is the calendrical achievement how Koreans in, the, in 1442 could calculate all the exact motions, movements of the seven heavenly uh, bodies, including five planets and the two moving, moving bodies, uh, the, 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 the sun and the moon. So seven luminaries calculated exactly the positions of the seven luminaries in, at the exact moment of the time. And that calculations made, made it possible to predict exactly when solar eclipse and lunar eclipses can happen in Koreans, Korean, Korean Korea. So this kind of uh, several items I try to, and other than that, to do, to achieve this thing, uh, King Sejong here, uh, you, you can see this uh, statue in Gwanghamun. And this is uh, Ru. In the mid, in the uh, Gyeongbok Palace, King Sejong developed many kinds of astronomical instruments to observe the heavens and uh, record things of heavenly things, and uh, he established uh, instruments around the around the lake in Gyeongwaru. Today, I try to persuade the government, the Korean government, to re-establish the instruments as it had been, as they had been in the Sejong's reign, but Korean government doesn't hear to me. Uh, they are stubbornly political-minded, but not science-minded at all. Anyhow, this is one, the star charts made in the early Joseon dynasty, to be exact, it was, uh, it was uh, 
carved in a stone slab, uh, one meter, one meter, and two meters, one two meter, a stone slab, and uh, granite, I think. Anyhow, this uh, this star chart uh, shows. 1,466 stars. And this was uh, exactly uh, shows the real shape in, of the heavens at the time. And this similar thing is uh, found in China. Unfortunately, Chinese version is uh, about 100 some years before Korean version. So uh, this is not the uh, world first. Anyhow, this is uh, made in, in Joseon Dynasty, early Joseon Dynasty, and then this was uh, uh, the star observing platform uh, still preserved in, I think in, this one is in the Changgyeong Palace in Seoul. Uh, this is uh, what had been there in Gyeonghaeru Lake, north, north of Gyeonghaeru Lake in Sejong period. And of course, this is an imaginary drawing. And above the top of the platform, the, the, the astronomers observe the sky every night, five of them every night. That's, uh, the, that's recorded in the veritable records of the Chosun Dynasty. This is a Chinese uh, version of the, the same thing, uh, same thing constructed in, in Gyeongheru Lake area in Korea, Sejong period too. But it's not there in Korea, and this is a picture of a Chinese version. And uh, this is the uh, one, some very important uh, important uh, instrument. I explained it in lower part of page two. This is a uh, gnomon, the solar, the sun's height, measure, measuring sun's height, solar height, in the winter solstice, during the winter solstice. And every year at winter solstice, the sun, sun, the height of the sun is different, slight differences every year. And these measurements accumulated can help to make the exact calendrical calculation techniques at that point, at the spot in, in, on Earth. And this was built in or, uh, the, the northern, north, northern part of uh, Lake uh, Gyeongbok, Gyeongbok, uh, the Gyeongheru Lake. This, and uh, this lower part, this lower part, we have, uh, this is uh, actually first utilized camera, actually that is called camera obscura in Latin, and the camera obscura is a dark room. Dark room is attached here to measure the exact position of the shadow of this uh, parallel bar on top of this, uh, this pole. This pole is uh, about 10 meters high. So with 10 meter high pole, the, the bar, the shadow of the bar disappears. But using this uh, camera obscure device, you can measure exact position of the the fall of the, 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 the parallel bar. That's the King, King Sejong had utilized in, in those period. So I nicknamed this device, this device as a King Sejong's camera. Yeah. But no Korean is following me <laughs> yet. But in the future, many people will follow my uh, naming this device, I, I'm quite sure, perhaps after my death. Anyhow, oh, this is a device. Yeah. I wouldn't go.
go into details how, how it works. Um, some of you uh, conversant with some si basic science, say basic physics or basic optics, will understand what it works, okay? This is a sol sundial, the sun clock. It's a typical sun clock divide, uh, devised in King Sejong's period and widely used even today in Korea. Mm, not very seriously though, because we have all this uh, mechanical watch, right? Anyhow, this is another version carrying the... This is a water clock, very famous in Korea, water clock. Uh, first devised in, first developed in King Sejong also, but later uh, the King Sejong's version had destroyed, was destroyed completely. So about 100 years later, uh, that was uh, uh, copied, recopied, and that parts of the devices are remaining today. The water clock. How the water clock has worked? I wouldn't explain. Uh, this is uh, today's money, Korean money, use this, uh, this device. And uh, this background picture is the, the, the star chart I mentioned earlier. That's the background uh, picture. Next, here is the rain gauge. Rain gauge is uh, very famous in Korea uh, for Koreans, but Unfortunately, this rain gauge was, uh, yeah, rain, this rain gauge was also developed for the first time in the world history in King Sejong's rain period. In 1430 uh, some year, anyway. But unfortunately, this had been, for the past half a century around, this had been, uh, recognized by the historians of science, particularly Chinese historians of science, as their invention, not Korean. The reason is very simple. And the Chinese are innocently believe so. They cannot be blamed too much because, you see, when the Chinese, very famous Chinese meteorologist, as a matter of fact, the first modern meteorologist of China, was studying at Harvard in 1916. Unfortunately, he had seen a, a paper published in British, uh, in, in Britain, called British Journal of Meteorological Science or something. Anyway, British Meteorological Science Journal. And according to that, in that journal, this picture was uh, printed with the manuscript, with this picture. And if you see this picture, here rain title is shown. Rain title, this, Zhenlong. Zhenlong is uh, in Korean, Gonlong. This is Chinese rain title, not Korean rain title. That's the problem. The Chinese scholar honestly believed this is Chinese, not Korean. So he wrote that way, and after that, that became the Chinese invention. So today, Joseph, even Joseph Needham, any of you are familiar with his name? Yeah. He's a, yeah, quite famous uh, history of, historian of Chinese science. He even uh, made the mistake of uh, uh, considering this as Chinese invention, not Korean, based on this thing. Anyhow, uh, this is very unfortunate. Uh, this particular one is Zhenlong, uh, Gollyung, Gyeongin Owol, made in fifth month in, in the year Gyeongin. This means 1770. The year is 1770. Anyhow, uh, this, actually this uh, rain gauge was, was first recognized as a world first invention by the Koreans by the Japanese scholar called Wada Yuji. This is the gentleman. He became the head of Korean Meteorological uh, Institute during the Japanese period, early Japanese period. Anyhow, Wada Yuji uh, claimed this was a, the invention by the Koreans 
in 14, in 15th, early 15th century, but unfortunately later this became uh, misjudged by the Chinese scholars as Chinese invasion. Anyhow, the Chinese invasion, the claim of Chinese invasion is this, gen this gentleman, Zhu Goding. He, he passed away in 1974. He is a very famous Chinese scholar. The first Chinese meteorologist who built all the meteorological observation institutes around China, mainland China. So he's quite famous. Particularly, he's very famous or notable achievement in a way is his long diary. He wrote diary, uh, more than 10 volumes of diary. From the early 20s, his age, until several days before his death. He's very uh, uh, remarkable gentleman, too. He's have, oh, somehow he, this gentleman is, uh, is the, I mentioned about the Harvard educated meteorologist. This is a gentleman. Okay, then we go to the, the scientific revolution and all these things. If any of you are from Portugal? None of you. This is from Portugal, the Lisbon. Lisbon, monuments of the discoveries. And this is above the low, upper part of the monument. The lower part is this, lower part of the monument. This shows the Portuguese were the, were the discoverers of the East Asian countries. And as, as a matter of fact, that is true. The Portuguese came to, Japan, came to China for the first time as a Westerner uh, in 1503, I remember, 1503. And the, somehow, haphazard incident uh, blew them into, into the Japanese soil too, uh, 30 years later, no, 40 years later. In, in 1543, for the first time in, China, in Japanese history, the Portuguese arrived at the Dejima in southern part of Kyushu uh, Island. So this was the beginning of the context between the East and West in the East Asian uh, portion of the globe. So this, uh, but the, that context started with their arrival. Of course, their arrival was possible because uh, the exactly 100 year, years after the, after the initiation of the Joseon Dynasty, Korean history, incidentally, is uh, uh, mainly divided into three kingdoms period, and then Korea Dynasty period, and then Joseon Dynasty period. Every, every one of you are familiar with this part? Yeah, there's three major period of Korean history. About the, uh, not so much different periods, the, 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 the du durations. Anyhow, the first Three Kingdoms period lasted up to, uh, well, about uh, uh, 900 some years, so le let's say 1,000 years of history for Three Kingdoms. But after that, of almost 500 years period of Korea dynasty, then 500 years of Joseon dynasty, or Yi dynasty. Yi dynasty is somewhat a derogatory expression, so I wouldn't like to use Yi dynasty because Japanese love to use Yi dynasty, and for some reason. Anyhow, Joseon dynasty started in 1392. 1392, this is a history lesson for you. 1392, Joseon Dynasty started by General Yi song and exactly 100 years later, 1492, Columbus went to America to discover or to find or to, <laughs> to any way he went there, 100 years later. So, and if we, are, if we want to learn about Korean history, uh, chronology, a little more, then about, about, what about exactly 100 years after that discovery of America by Columbus? That 
that's very important in Korean history too. 1592, so 1392 Joseon Dynasty, 1492 Columbus went to America, 1592 Japanese invasion of Korea, very famous incident in Korean history. Anyhow, this, after the Columbus and uh, uh, Bartholomew Diaz discovery of Cape of Good Hope, that's about the same period. Then Europeans rushed into the East Asian, East Asian countries, and China, China was first, and Japan was the second. The the Westerners, Portuguese, the Portuguese first arrived in China in 1503, and then 40 years later uh, in Japan in four, in in 1543. But Nobody came to Korea. That's the key point, very important point, to my mind, to my interpretation of Korean history. That's very important. So I, that's, uh, that's the part in my manuscript page. So I turn to page six, then we can come up with uh, what happened in China and in Japan, and then Korea. The, in China, they came to, in China, in 1601, the Italian-born, Italian-born uh, Matteo Rich, the missionary, Jesuit missionary, arrived in, in Beijing and stayed there thereafter for the missionary activities as well as uh, teaching Western science and technology uh, to the Chinese. So this kind of Chinese learning of science and technology started in 1601 or some, somewhat before that and continued on and on. And how about Japan? In Japan, the Koreans' visit to Japan was welcomed in traditional period. This is a picture about 17 under the some year, a Korean mission, missions was a Korean em embassy was dispatched to Japan, and the traditional Japan and Japanese were welcoming very highly of the Koreans' arrival because Japanese were were very secluded country at the time, and they wanted to know about the the traditional Chinese or Korean uh, civilizations. So. Many Japanese were eager to meet Koreans and uh, get some advice or some comments on their uh, writings or pictures, whatever. So this kind of welcoming scene is uh, uh, thrown into pictures and preserved. Many of these kind of pictures are preserved in Japan, and some are in, even in Korea too. Anyhow, that's a traditional period. But and during this period, Koreans' influence in, in Japanese science were evident too. So this is uh, some part I, I tried to show, but, but exactly at the period, 17th century or, yeah, 17th century thereafter, the Japanese were eagerly learning Western science and technology directly from the Japanese from the Western missionary stationed in Japan. That never happened in Korea. So they were learning, uh, while they were learning the Western science and technology, they were eager to have some kind of diplomatic relations with the West too. So this gentleman is uh, uh, Tate Masa Mune Desho. I wrote this uh, gentleman's name uh, somewhere. Anyway, this, this is a huge load of Sendai, Sendai area, Sendai. Have you ever been to Sendai, Japan? The north, northern part, the mainland, main Honshu land. The Sendai part, uh, huge load, even there, this load was uh, already 
well knowledge knowledgeable about the Western science and technology, and that he wanted to have some kind of diplomatic relations with the West. So he, this is a gentleman, because he was a one-eyed gentleman, one-eyed. So anyhow, this general was, uh, was in Korea too. He, he was dispatched to Korea during the Japanese invasion. Anyhow, he made the, made a mission and built a ship and sent his ship with the Western missionary as the, with the missionary as the head of the mission and the vice chief Japanese they were sent to Roman Catholic Church to Rome to meet the Roman the Rome Pope of the Rome and they had some kind of the, the context, direct context, is a, a papal office and they had some kind of uh, uh, agreement. This is an agreement uh, reached by these two parties, the Pope, papal office, and the Japanese feudal lord. But this was never executed in the exactly. This is a, a somewhat different uh, thing in Japan. Uh, happened in Japan because uh, in the western part of Japan, Japanese uh, uh, feudal laws, they sent separate mission to Rome and uh, this mission was uh, made of, of ch children mainly. So this was, uh, this was happening, this is the date as you can see is the uh, end of 16th century, right? 16th century they were already sent to the Rome. This was an aggressive attitude of Japanese to reach some kind of uh, agreement or some kind of relations with the Western countries. This happened in Japan. And in the, in the process, in 1774, I consider this is a very important event in East Asian history. In 1774, Suida Genpaku uh, trans and the two other, other young men of Japan translated the Western book on anatomy as a Kaitai Shinsho. This is uh, the first such translation from Western science into, into East Asian languages for the first time. And this translation was done not by the Westerners, but by the the, 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 the Japanese. The similar thing happened about uh, 200 years, about 200 years after this by the Japanese, uh, by the Chinese. Chinese did the similar translations only from the 1880s. But Japanese translated the Western science book already in, in 1774, so not 200, 100 years, about 110 years before the Chinese. And how about Korea? Korea did not, Koreans could not translate any Western books into Korean until 20th century, I think, 20th century. Probably or after the liberation, Koreans could translate, could and did translate the first Western science books into Korean. Unfortunately, this is very uh, remarkable uh, thing uh, to understand. Uh, this is just a joke, as a joke. I put this uh, picture. How, have you ever been there? This is a house ten bush, house ten bush, of uh, in uh, Nagasaki, Japan. Nagasaki area is a suburb of Nagasaki. Uh, and uh, I have never been there, but anyhow, uh, one, one gag man of Korea, about 10, more than 10 years, about almost 20 years ago, had, uh, had uh, uh, shown in television show, and, uh, commented when they visited this, uh, this uh, amusement park, he commented, Japanese are very 
very intelligent and very uh, commercial-minded people. Why they built uh, the, the, the Dutch, Dutch palace, uh, Dutch garden here without any, any relation with Dutch, Dutch, with the Dutch? But he was completely ignorant that the Japanese had a close relationship with the Dutch in the 18th century, and that's the beginning of the Japanese learning of Western civilization. Anyhow, actually, I prepared this PowerPoint show from my Korean version, so that's why this somehow happened to be included here. Uh, this is, for, for instance, you see, for, for instance, Japanese were, Japanese uh, in, I, I don't remember exactly, but in 1820, in, the, in some year in 1820, I think I wrote the fact in, in detail here, the English, English young, young boy named Global came to Japan through Shanghai as a kind of errand boy for, the, for, for some uh, trader point for the, for the British. And he grew up as an independent, independent merchant and very much successful. He built a, a mansion and on top of the hill of Nagasaki. Still, that house is, of course, remodeled and changed a lot, but still there today uh, as a global house in Japan. This uh, uh, this tourist point today. Anyhow, this is the statue of this global, and uh, this is the house, his house in Nagasaki, the, up, up the hill of the Nagasaki, and that on the hill, some American visited there, uh, and he communicated the the story about the Japanese uh, Japanese episode to a uh, uh, noble novelist in America, uh, whose name was Long, uh, Luther Long, John Luther Long, and he wrote a small story storybook novel called Madame Butterfly, based on the the story he heard, and this one was, became, became drama and played in London in, in 18, anyhow, uh, 19, early 19 some year, and at the night, at one of the, the night, the play was seen by uh, Giacomo Puccini. So he wrote the story into opera. So it's a very famous opera today, uh, the Madame Butterfly. This is a Korean uh, version of uh, Nabi Buin, Madame Butterfly, Jojo Fujin. Anyhow, so Western, in short, arrival to Western men of knowledge, China in 1913, Guangdong area, already Western missionaries were arriving and they were uh, active in, in China, particularly 1601, Matthew Rich in Beijing. And in Japan, oh, one more A, <laughs> not, not two A, a of course. Japan in 1543, Kagoshima, arrival Japan. But in Korea, only in 1830s, Western missionaries arrived in Korea to stay. But they meant to stay in Korea, but they were summarily caught and executed on the spot. So that's the story of Korea in, in compared with Westerners. Then how about the, the fluency in Western languages? Western languages critical tool, the very important tool, indispensable tool for understanding Western science and technology, Western civilization. In China, 
Oh yeah, one episode I read from Chinese book, not not Japanese book. A Chinese, the modern Chinese book, carried this story, this episode I quote from that book. Fukusawa Yukichi. Fukusawa Yukichi is, uh, if you are not familiar with Fukusawa Yukichi, if you if you had seen the Japanese currency, the highest uh, denomination as uh, Ichimangen, I think. Ichimangen? Correct? Any Japanese? Anyhow, I think uh, 10,000 yen, Japanese currency, carries his, his portrait, Fukusawa Yukichi. That much he is a very famous uh, gentleman, Fukusawa Yukichi. He is the, the leader of modern civilization in Japan. He was in London in 1862, Fukusawa Yukichi. And he met a Chinese diplomat, or Chinese anyway, Chinese scholar, and they had a conversation. And in Fukusawa, uh, the, the Chinese asked Fukusawa how many foreign language speakers are there in Japan. And the Fukusawa answered, oh, no, no. I, he asked Chinese first, and the Chinese answered, we have about 11. I don't know why it's 11. Is it 12 or about 10 or about 20, but somehow 11, according to the document, uh, it reads 11. Anyway, 11 Chinese were, were conversant with the Western language, probably English, in, in, in 1862. But when the Chinese retorted, asked the same question to Fukusawa, Fukusawa answered about 500. That's exactly the position of the, of the Chinese and Japanese in the point, at the point of, toward the end of 19th century, early 19th century, later half of the, early, later half of the 19th century, in 1862. How about Korea? There were none in Korea who can, who understand the foreign language at all in 1862. Only, ten, only 21 years later, 21 years later, Yun Chi Ho, Korean Yun Chi Ho, had first started to learn English, not in Korea, but in Japan. But he was uh, uh, simply picked up by the first American, the American delegate to be stationed in Seoul, and he picked up Yun Chi Ho and came to Korea uh, with uh, Yun Chi Ho at the time was uh, barely speaking English, of course. He, his English was uh, low, very low. The level was very low, naturally so, because he was learning English about three or four months already. So he was picked up by the uh, Lucius Foot, the first ambassador, not ambassador, any, anyhow, emissary to, to Korea, American emissary to Korea. Anyway, he picked up him, and also a Japanese interpreter was accompanied. So Japanese interpreter interpreted the first into Japanese, then Yun Chi Ho, uh, here English version and the Japanese version, and then translated into Korean. That kind of conversation was going on for almost half a year until the end of that year when Yun Chi Ho became the independent interpreter of Korean government as well as uh, the Koreans anyhow. This is how what it happened. Anyhow, this is, oh, this is a Japanese Fukusawa Yukichi. I put this picture too. Uh, this was uh, when he was uh, visiting uh, the Dutch, the, the Netherlands in 16, uh, 1862. And this is a Korean novelist, very famous. I wrote this thing in my manuscript, Lee Gwang Su. He wrote the so called the first Korean novel in, in 1917, 1917, called Mujong. And in Mujong, he was, he was saying this much. I wrote this thing in my manuscript too. He was completely ignorant of modern science, the meaning or whatever. But he felt the importance of science and technology in Korea at the time. That much 
I can say. Anyhow, uh, Korea could uh, develop. At the, at the point of liberation of Korea in, for, in 1945, Korea was completely uh, void of any science and technology. Because during the Japanese period, only 204, I myself uh, studied the, that, in, during the Japanese period, 35 years or 40 years, whatever, whichever you like to uh, use, anyway, almost 40 years of Japanese domination in Korea, the Japanese, the Koreans tried to study science technology in Japan because Korean continent, Korean peninsula, did not have any higher institution of learning for science and technology at all. It was not allowed by the Japanese colony, colonial policy. Anyhow, the, many of them went to Jap Japan and studied. Only 204 during the 40 years had graduated from college with degrees in science and engineering. That p mere number, only about 200 scientists, scientists and engineers of uh, barely graduated uh, from colleges, Korea could not uh, build uh, an independent modern nation at, at the liberation at all. That's the pity for the Korean history. Anyhow, after only in the 1950, uh, uh, and the furthermore, Korean War was there, as you know, probably, 50 and 53, there was a Korean War. And during that period, some Koreans escaped the military duty and went to America and Europe and Japan. Uh, and that, that, happened, that happened. And then in 1959, 19, in 1950s, so mid-1950s, there was an Atom for Peace program of America. And then made some Koreans could go to America for their higher learning. And that's the opportunity for some Koreans. Anyhow, this kind of opportunities made the, uh, the, and then in nine, 1965, May, Korea-America summit meeting was held in Washington. And in that, as a result of that meeting, actually, I, I understand my student uh, di discovered it was not suggested by the Korean president. But American president, Lyndon Johnson, proposed to build a higher, higher research institute in Korea for scientists and engineers. And as a result of the summit, anyhow, the Korea could uh, establish a KIST, the Korean Institute of Science and Technology, in 60s, 1966. This was the beginning of the brain-drained Korean the students came back to Korea. This is a very important turning point in Korean history, for the, particularly for the history of science. So this is a groundbreaking ceremony by the KIST, by President Park Jong-hee, and this gentleman is the, the first, first chief of the KIST. And then, believe it or not, I was there. <laughs> you see? You cannot see this thing here. <laughs> that picture, I ex enlarged the picture. You can tell which one is, my, which is me? This one. This one is me. And I have never shaken hands with President Park Jong-hee. But I was there. I didn't know that myself. I was a reporter of Joseon da no, no, at the time, Chungang Daily News, and I was, uh, uh, I went, uh, participated for the groundbreaking ceremony as a reporter, newspaper reporter. Anyhow, that's what happened. Oh, this is my, my book. I wrote uh, my book in Korean. Many Korean books I have, but I translated myself into English. So this is published in Los Angeles, some, some, uh, some ignoble place, I don't know where, where, where that, be, but anyway, in America. It's published in America. 
I don't have any copies, but I have uh, three copies only. So in Korea, whether you can buy it or not, I'm not sure. But I have uh, another version. He introduced another uh, very interesting, actually, uh, book on Korean history of science. He introduced it already. It's published in Korea in, in English. So, so if you want to pick it up, uh, you can do so. Uh, anyhow, the, this wraps up my speech tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.